Hi friends, Tracy here to tell you that making a podcast is hard work. There's research, scripts, editing, and all of that can mean a million decisions. Fortunately for me, my choice in a podcast hosting platform was easy because I decided upon Anchor by Spotify. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your podcast today. Welcome to Crescent City Crime, dear listeners. I'm Tracy. And I'm Brian. And we want to thank everybody who's been listening to us. Thank you for telling a friend. If you want to further support the show, you can always leave us a review, a five-star review, no matter how bad we might sound. Please do this on your preferred podcasting platform. And of course, if you don't like somebody, you can aggressively yell, listen to Crescent City Crime at them instead of fighting with them. Yes, a very constructive approach and leaving it on a positive note always. Yes, and speaking of positive notes, we're here to tell you that nothing, not equipment failure or a scratch cornea, is going to prevent us from recording this podcast. Both of those things happened to us last week. It has been quite a week for us, Brian. Yes, and including my working overnight and the day the day that it happened to you uh, having very little sleep because I was on an overnight film shoot. Yes. Yeah. So if you're not married to somebody like Brian, you need to be. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Love. Oh, well, today's episode is going to be a lot more serious than equipment failure or scratch corneas, unfortunately. But I did want to let everybody know that, yes, I am okay. My eye is recovering nicely. I have no idea what the heck was in there. It might have been a piece of glitter, honestly. Yep, whatever it is, I'm glad it's glad it's out and glad you're on the mend. Yes, and thankfully, the doctor was very patient with me and he thoroughly examined my eyes. He looked deep into my eyes. He looked deeper into my eyes than anybody has in my whole life. Yeah. In general, the Oshner clinics and the Oshner hospital is one of the best uh, healthcare providers in the metropolitan area of New Orleans. Yes. And luckily they take my insurance. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's good also. <laughs> in last week's episode, we gave a brief overview of a series of killings that took place in the New Orleans area That started in 1991. 27 dead women were found scattered in remote areas just outside of the New Orleans metro area. Most of them had drugs in their systems. Some were strangled, some were beaten, and some were drowned. Many of them had arrest records for drugs or soliciting. Some of them were working mothers struggling to support young children. In 1995, Sharon Robinson and Karen Iverson were found in 1995 along the rural I-55 corridor within hours of each other. The women were friends and Sharon used to date Victor Gant, who was an NOPD officer. Victor abused Sharon and even though he is the strongest suspect in the murders of Sharon and Karen, he has never been officially charged with any crime. He may have also been responsible for the murder of young Daniel Britton. She, like Karen and Sharon, did not have any drugs in her system, and those women were also strangled to death. A woman who survived a similar attack is only known under the alias of Brenda, was able to work with a police sketch artist, and the composite looks similar to Victor Gantz. In today's episode... We are going to talk about the person who was convicted on a single charge. 
and we will discuss the possibility of a third killer. Yeah, there's some, it's possibly a copycat or it's, it's coincidental. Well, what I always go back to is, you know, in, in all of my true crime documentary watching, podcast listening and such, the thing that it's really always taught me is that people like this are organized. They have a preferred method. They have a, a, a ritual to it, to them. It, so if you have, so to me, if you have victims dying in three different ways, it feels like there could be more than one person out there doing this. Or it could be that this is a hobby for the serial killer. Well, of course it's a hobby. Whereas, but in every hobby, there's variations. Doing that's, things different ways. That's true. That's true. But that is what we're going to talk about today. And you can debate this endlessly, but we're not going to because we have a time limit. So let's get going. In 1993... Dolores Mack and Cheryl Lewis were found a day apart in the same canal off Louisiana Highway 3160 in Hanville, Louisiana. Brian, uh, Hanville, as you know, is a sleepy, quiet community. It's about a half hour away from New Orleans proper. And what goes on there at night, Brian? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. <clears throat> there might be one or two convenience stores open in Hanville. In the middle of the night. That's correct. Now, Cheryl Lewis and Dolores Mack had traces of drugs in their systems. It would be the investigation into the deaths of those women in particular that would lead law enforcement to a cab driver named Russell Elwood. Russell Elwood was born in Ohio and moved to New Orleans when he graduated high school in 1968. For the next 30 years, he struggled with addiction. He would often live in squalor, had no permanent residence, never married, and changed professions often, but his primary job was cab driving. Because of his addiction, Elwood was arrested several times from 1968 to 1998. When he was not imprisoned, he spent most of his time among street people. He was described as an outsider who was constantly involved in get-rich-quick schemes, but he also consistently failed in his endeavors. So he sounds like a loser. You could you could say that. Now, there's a lot of people who've never been arrested before in their entire lives who drift from job to job and wound up going wind up going back and forth to what ends up being their primary profession. You see it with cab drivers. You see it with people who are waitresses and waiters. You see it with people who are security guards. But the the difference here is these people might, some of them may be neurotic, have some mental health issues, but they're not violent people. They're not. They're career, not bad people. Right. They're not bad people. They're not career criminals. criminals. Right. Yeah. So most of what you actually described is actually normal for some people. Well, to be, to clarify, I called him a loser because he's a convicted murderer. That's a good reason. Yes. That's a good reason to call him a loser. Yes. yes. And quite frankly, uh, you know, someone who drifts from job to job and keeps going back to their original profession. Personally, I don't consider that person a, a loser. I consider that someone who perseveres and never gives up. Right. Right. Well. He inherited money from his mother, but he invested it poorly. He lost the money, and he used a taxi vehicle as, as his own home. That's not too uncommon. So a lot of people do live in cars. Yes, that's that has happened quite quite often. Most notably during uh, COVID nineteen, because of people being out of work, uh, and they couldn't pay their rents. Right. They just simply. A lot of people just simply did that. That's true. Elwood first came under police scrutiny in 1994. He was found masturbating in his car by the police. He was parked by the same road 
where Cheryl Lewis and Dolores Mack's bodies had been found. He was partially undressed when the police forced him out of his car and told him to show his driver's license. Now, Brian, um, <laughs> <laughs> some somehow I thought you were going to say something else when you said show his. Uh... <laughs> well, what, Brian, would you like to know what excuse he gave the police? Well, I don't know, but I can tell you what the charge would be if you get if you get arrested for committing such an act in public, even if it is uh, in in your own vehicle. If someone can see you through the window of your vehicle doing it, uh, even it's also it's called lewd. Uh, lewd conduct. Lewd conduct. Right? Yeah. Well, his excuse as to why he was out there at nighttime, where there's you know no lights, no nothing, no convenience store, no gas station really open, is that he was stopping to change the oil and repair the brake pads of his car. That is a terrible lie, <laughs> because any. Any police officer, even a rookie, would would ask would ask well, really okay. Well, um, where's where did you put the old brake pads and and uh, yeah, where's your brake fluid? Well, he willingly allowed his vehicle to be searched, but officers found officers found none of the items required for the fixes, not even a flashlight, which would be necessary in. Hanville, Louisiana, at nighttime, if you're doing such work, and pro- probably not even the tools that you need to, you know. Of course, he maybe he had one of a, a uh, an axle to uh, you know, one of those four way tire irons, okay, right. or, or two way or one way. Maybe he had one of those in the car to take the tire off, but he apparently didn't have any of the ratchet wrenches needed. To remove the brake, to remove the brakes, and to open the brakes and take the brake pads out. Right, and and I bet his hands didn't have any oil on them. Which from would, doing this would also beg the question: If you're doing such a job on the side of the road at night, where are you going to wash your hands? Exactly, and, and and then another thing: even a rookie would know that that's just not something you do in some random location in the middle of the night with with no light. Yes. Nobody changes their brake pads there. Everybody does it in one or two places, either in front of the auto zone if they let you do it in the parking lot, which they might not, or in your driveway. Or at a friend's house. Or at a friend's house. Because yeah, it, exactly. If, if it, your house is like ours, then you don't have a driveway. Right. But people have changed their brakes on the, uh, you know, like the parking, the parking area of our, of our street. Which it's fine. I mean, it's a public street, but a- a- anyway. We're, we're, Which of course is officially against Orleans Parish, uh, ordinance. Orleans Parish law. Yeah. yeah. There's an Orleans Parish ordinance that says you're not allowed to do that on city property. Whether or not it's enforced is a different thing. Times I know of when it's been enforced is it's against someone who is essentially habitually making auto repairs on a public street for a living without any kind of license or storefront. And and on top of that has been a nuisance to the neighborhood where he or she is doing this. Then uh, you police from the district or the additional patrol, in our case, mid city security district may come out and issue a citation. They might because you might be finished before they even get here. (laughs) (laughs) So, anyway, the officers did not find any cause to arrest him that night, so they let him go. But from that moment on, he was under suspicion. Now, in last week's episode, I mentioned the task force that was formed. And Colonel Walter T. Gorman of the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office and other task force members traveled to Sebring, Florida on July the 23rd, 1997, so they could question Elwood, who was living with his elderly father. Once located, he was informed of his rights and within three days gave several statements recorded on tape. During the interrogations, he admitted to visiting sex workers and claimed that he knew more than 100 girls and that he frequently used drugs such as heroin, crack cocaine, and LSD. 
the investigators became increasingly suspicious when Elwood started speaking about having a dream. Yeah, having, wow, having okay. a dream. That's something to talk to the police about. In which he was being questioned about a series of murders and later admitting to frequenting the locations where the bodies were found, but he continued to reaffirm his innocence. That, I, I mean, I, I don't understand why you, anyone would want to share something like that with the police unless this officer just happens to be your best friend and you're, you know, you're seeing him at your science fiction club or your comic book convention or for dinner at your house. You know, just just something to laugh about. But this is someone who, for all intents and purposes, is a stranger to to law enforcement. So that you're you're tipping. He's tipped them off that something's really, really off, really odd about him. And between admitting to all this association with sex workers, numerous sex workers and use of illegal drugs and having these strange dreams, he's letting them know that, well, yes, he's definitely a, per, a person of interest, and he's, as they say, as they say back in the day, he's guilty of something. Yes, he was, he was definitely guilty of something. On August 4th, 1997, so that's less than, you know, 10 days after the interrogations were completed, Elwood was arrested for buying cocaine from an undercover police officer at his home in Florida. As a result, he was convicted and sentenced to spend 85 days in the county jail. It would be during this time that a person who identified himself as Clay called the Howard Stern Show. He claimed to be a serial, a serial killer, and what he said has led some to believe that he is actually Russell Elwood. During that call, and Brian, you, you listened to this call with me. Yes, yes, it's very intriguing listening. Howard Stern actually did an amazing job interviewing this guy. It's the same tactic that detectives will use to interrogate a suspect. Howard Stern purposely misquoted the details that the caller gave him so that the caller corrected him. So Howard Stern was trying to catch him in a lie and wasn't able to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, because the caller corrects Howard, it feels like he's not lying to me. That's what it feels like to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the call interested law enforcement enough to where Howard Stern himself said that a copy was given over to them. But what evidence was garnered from that call is unknown. In this call, the uh, Clay mentions Swaggart Town. There's a possibility that he was referring to Baton Rouge, where the former televangelist Jimmy Swaggart ran his ministry, but it could also mean Airline Highway, which connects New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And at that time, Airline Highway was a popular place for sex workers to do their business. There used to be a lot of hourly rate motels and whatnot. Yes, that was before there was a, before that law was passed. And which law was that? I don't remember the name of the law, but it made it illegal for motels and hotels to charge an hourly rate. Oh, I remember that now. Yeah, that that was a while ago, but I do remember that. And and that's um, the state state of Louisiana. I guess I guess you could say it was a good idea. That pretty much uh, Harry Lee's Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Department is in Sheriff Harry Lee. Oh, a See, for, former sheriff. He did pass away a while ago. Right, yeah. right. It's not. He pretty he ran probably I would say ninety nine point nine percent of the prostitutes off of Airline Drive. Now, the caller mentions using a hammer as his uh, weapon of choice, and if Elwood was in jail during this time, do you think it would have been possible to call the Howard Stern Show from jail? It'd be an interesting feat. Considering the length of the call, I think it, it it could have been pulled off. Okay. With the use of a, I believe phone cards were were in you were pretty popular back then. I think so. Yeah, that's so right. With the use of a phone card. Okay. A phone call could have been made from the inside of the jail. Okay. 
it's possible. Although I kind of wonder whether or not the FBI, because the FBI was the ones who requested a copy of that tape I from Howard Stern. I think it was the FBI, yes. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that the FBI quietly uh, looked into the phone records from that prison. Right. Want, wanted tran, you know, wanted transcripts of any calls that he made from that prison. Now, if it was not Elwood, then who was the caller? Was there possibly a third killer uh, on the loose at that time? Uh, there might be because the timeline of when the bodies were found. Uh, the caller mentions that his car broke down so he couldn't go out and kill anyone for a while. And there was a year-long gap between bodies being found. So there is a possibility that it might be a third person. Uh, you could debate this, of course, but if it's a prank, it's one of the best pranks I've ever heard. Definitely. It was it was so it was so convincing. Very creepy. Yes. It wasn't the kind of I mean if it was a pack if it was a bunch of lies, very convincing. And it wasn't exactly the kinds of not exactly the kinds of lies that you hear from a pathological liar. That's true. Now for legal reasons, we cannot run the audio of that call on this podcast, but I will link the audio in the show notes and be aware that the call is creepy, but if you feel like you can handle it, it's worth a listen. Uh, content warning for transphobia and specific mentions of crimes that were committed against women. Now, putting the phone call aside, during those 85 days in prison, Elwood implicated himself in the killings to his fellow inmates. One of them, uh, a, ma- a, a fellow inmate named Stan Hill, contacted the county prosecutor's office and claimed that Elwood had described to him in detail how he had driven the women to outlying areas of the city. He offered them large quantities of drugs. He assaulted, murdered, and dumped their bodies. A number of other inmates witnessed a fight between Elwood and another inmate, during which Elwood alleged, allegedly said, Yeah, I killed that racial and sexist slur, and I'll kill you too. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> really? Wow. That's, that's something. I mean, these types of people who are, of course, engaged in their own kind of sadistic hobby uh, they they want people to share in certain situations they want people to, to share their fascinations with well which is which is one of the reasons why they'll boast about it in jail they're, they're looking for someone with the same fascination well funny you should say that because a different inmate named Stephen michael busser also told police that Elwood had boasted of being wanted for more than 60 murders within the state of Louisiana, and he had even described to him in great detail one of the murders. So he was possibly trying to share his fascination with that inmate. Yeah. Yeah. A jailhouse informant who served time with Russell Elwood also spoke to investigators. He said that Elwood told him that he would lure the victims into his cab by selling them drugs. He would then inject them with a mixture of drugs that would contain a high amount of heroin. Like we said last week, if you take too many drugs, things happen to your body to where you can't take anymore. But somebody can put them into your body. Yes, someone who is not a pharmacist or a doctor... Somebody unqualified. Yes, yes. And you have no idea what they're giving you because the, uh, what should I say, the uh, the testing period mm-hmm. is literally on the street. That's very true. In the illegal drug trade. The mixture would paralyze the victims and 
Elwood would rape them in the back of his cab. He would murder and then dump them. The informant said to investigators, Elwood got off watching their eyes roll into the back of their heads. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a narcissistic, <sighs> sadistic psychopath. Mm-hmm. The only thing Elwood did not have was authority. That's very true. But, but he would have, given the opportunity, he would he would have he would have gotten line for it. Definitely. He's now. I don't want to say too much about this right now, but he's definitely one of those people who would have shown up at the SS office during the night, early nineteen thirties, to volunteer. Hmm. Yeah. Or, or for the brown shirts prior to that. Yeah. Yep. That type of person. Now, in spite of this information and all these uh, inmates giving this, giving this uh, information, I, I, I'm sorry, that was so awkwardly worded, but that it is what it is. It wasn't enough to charge Russell Elwood, but the net was starting to close around him. After Elwood was released from prison, he moved to Canton, Ohio. While there, the task force interviewed him yet again. It was during this time that Russell Elwood confessed, confessed to dumping a black woman in the water off of a rural, rural road. The details were similar to how Cheryl Lewis and Dolores Mack were killed. However, the confession was not taped and he later recanted it. Eventually, he was released again, and in January of 1998, he returned to New Orleans. On January the 16th, he was stopped by traffic cops for speeding and was scheduled to appear in court, but he failed to appear on time, and he was arrested for contempt of court. He was eventually convicted and ordered to spend 120 days behind bars. While he was incarcerated, authorities charged him with the murders of Cheryl Lewis and Dolores Mack, on March the 4th, 1998. And then the trial began on June the 8th, 1999 in Lafayette, Louisiana. During the proceedings, a number of Elwood's former cellmates and sex workers testified as prosecution witnesses. Diane Gillum, a former sex worker, told the court that she had known Elwood since the early 1990s and dated him periodically. She testified that in 1992, during a date, Elwood, while under the influence of drugs, assaulted, beat, and strangled her into unconsciousness. Gillum stated that she woke up to find herself in a pool of blood in an, in an unfamiliar, wooded area where a passing motorist found her by chance and sheltered her at the motel he was staying at. She said that she did not report the incident due to being a sex worker with a criminal record. Yeah. So this is how a lot of these sickos get away with this because they pick people who would feel shame in, in reporting. They they enjoy preying upon weak people. Well, vulnerable members of society. Yes, that 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 is what I mean. To them, okay, not okay, you see these people as being vulnerable, which is true. Right. Okay. But the criminal predator, psychopathic them predator, just sees them as weak. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. This, this, this is not the kind of guy who's going to try to hunt down a United States Marine. Right. Okay. No, he's he's not that kind of predator. He probably would even run away from like from a security guard. Yes, because the security guard is authority. It is is authority. Uh, often carries a firearm and at least has basic training with that firearm so that security guard is considered to be a threat. Which is why, you know, in general, when you're walking down the street, it's best to look like you know where you're going, be aware of your surroundings, even look a little bit aggressive yourself because the typical criminal predator is not interested in preying upon someone who is aware of the surroundings and potentially aggressive. You you are correct, and we have more to get through, though. You're, so, you ready? Ready. <laughs> Another girl, Nevesa Richmond, 
another sex worker, in turn testified that she had also been beaten and assaulted twice by Elwood, during which he also attempted to strangle her. Janie Stokes was, a, was another sex worker. She told the court that she first met Elwood in either 1992 or 1993 at a gas station in Marrero, where he was working as a cab driver. She said that Elwood bought her lunch and treated her nicely before driving her to uh, his home, where he suggested that they use cocaine. After doing drugs together, he beat her, but she managed to flee. Janie Stokes, like the other victims, did not report the incident because she was a drug addict. Yeah, yeah, typical pattern. That's the kinds of people these sadistic predators love to go after. They're thinking in their head, oh, you're not going to say anything to the police. <laughs> huh. And, I mean, these these two women are, are very lucky to be alive. Well, this is why we... most people do not survive those kinds of encounters. That's very true. And this is also why we need to remove the stigma around drug addicts, mental health, and sex workers. Because if, you know, th this is where the vulnerable members of society are and things like this happen to them and they don't report it or they're not believed or any number of things. A drug dealer named Antoinette Rainey also appeared as a, as a witness for the prosecution, testifying that Elwood, Elwood was a regular customer. She recounted an incident in which Elwood forced her into his car at gunpoint, drove her to an underpass where he beat, raped, robbed, threatened to kill her during the attack, but she was also able to escape. Three witnesses testified they had seen, seen the defendant with Cheryl Lewis shortly before her disappearance. According to the testimony of Denise Sanders, who was Cheryl Lewis's best friend, she had seen her with Elwood three days prior, who was out driving his cab. Sanders also admitted to withholding this information because she was a drug dealer. The second witness, Antoinette Holmes, who lived near Cheryl Lewis, testified to seeing her at a restaurant in Bridge City two weeks before she was reported missing, standing between two parked cars and talking to a cab driver. You she, don't say. Yeah, you don't say. She, well, she identified Elwood as the driver. Weinrier Henry, Lewis's cousin, stated that she last saw her at a hotel in Avondale with a man who she also identified as Elwood. According to her, Cheryl Lewis had told Henry that she and Elwood were on their way to a suburb of New Orleans where her body was later found. Henry testified that she had not given the police this information as she was wanted for petty offenses at the time. Elwood himself denied knowing any of the victims or committing any murders, although he could not provide any solid alibis. That's an amazing story. He doesn't remember any of these people at all, but they all remember him. That's quite true, yes. And Cheryl Lewis's mother admitted that her daughter was a drug addict and a sex worker, but she herself had never met Russell Elwood. His attorneys argued that Elwood was, was not in New Orleans at the time of the murders, claiming that he had been in Ohio with some relatives. Now, Elwood was known for keeping extensive amounts of documents that indicate his whereabouts. And this is the 90s, okay? We don't have smartphones where you can just be tracked through, like, your Google mm -hmm. apps mm -hmm. and whatnot, okay? So, at the time, you literally needed receipts, bits of paper yep. to show where you've been. And mm -hmm. this guy kept his receipts. Now, that's another interesting trait of... The Nazis. This guy had a lot of a lot in common with the Nazis. Believe it or not, yes. No, mm -hmm. you're. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Another another thing he has in common. Yeah, yeah. Psych psychopaths do tend to be organized. Very intelligent. Organized. Organized. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now the documentation that he kept indicated that he was out of state when Dolores Mack was killed but he could not provide an alibi for himself during the murder of Cheryl Lewis. Elwood was found guilty of killing Cheryl Lewis and was sentenced to life imprisonment 
imprisonment without parole on August the 17th, 1999. After his arrest, photos of Elwood in different disguises were released to the public. This resulted in new leads when people reported bad experiences with Russell Elwood to law enforcement. Those leads caused Elwood to be under suspicion for the deaths of Lola Porter, Linda Coleman, and Linda DiBenedito. There were even some reports from people who called the task force to describe incidents that their dead loved ones had with Russell Elwood prior to their deaths. So, yeah, so this guy got around and not in a good way. A lot of people knew him and a lot of people knew that uh, that he was not a good person, that he was seen with the victims. He hurt people that, you know, that were later found dead. Yeah, and he was able to do it for an extended period of time because of the stigma surrounding the people he selected as right. victims. Uh, Lieutenant Sue Rushing of the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office was the lead investigator on the case. She was not surprised that so many people responded to the photos. She said that he's like a chameleon. He was able to change his appearance so much that it was incredible. The arrest of Russell Elwood was based on a general pattern of behavior, and while Elwood did not directly admit to any of the other murders, he made references to homicides that he had committed. He said about the murder that took place on Louisiana Highway 3160, I'm willing to say I met a black female. I put her in the back seat. That's where all my affairs went. And that I took her out in St. Charles Parish where I was later stopped and I put her body in the water. I'm willing to give you that. Well, I mean... Uh, obviously, nobody does that to someone just once and then turns over a new leaf, okay? Right. It's, that type of behavior is habitual. It is career behavior. If you admit to committing a capital offense to law enforcement, what you have told them is that this is pretty much a regular thing for you, or you're willing to do this if the exact same opportunity or situation presents itself to you again. Right. In either case, you don't deserve to be on the street, in your home, or anywhere in society except a penal institution. Well or the said. grave. Well said. Overall, of the 27 victims, there was evidence linking Russell Elwood to 10 of the murders. But there was only enough evidence to bring charges for the murder of one, and that was Cheryl Lewis. Thankfully, that was enough. One, one murder should be enough. It's just so sad, though. I mean, there's, you know, 26 other women that we will never know what actually happened to them, who actually hurt them. Or, and I mean, we won't, we just won't know anything. These, these are cold cases. Yeah. In most of these situations, it's, it's for reasons of their, their habits or their economic situation. Let's say a, a, a poor working woman, single, a poor working woman, single mother. Society in general devalued them, marginalized them, and that opened the door for, that always opens the door for these sadistic, psychotic serial killers who marginalize practically anyone and everyone. That's right. Especially and if it's someone who is is bigoted in his case in his case he was bigoted towards women he considered to be lesser than him lesser than him or people he considered to be throw women whom he considered to be throwaway people right and this is why like so like if anybody is listening to this if you've ever asked yourself why sex work should be legalized this is why 
this this whole case and countless others like it or why. Nobody should be able to get away with something like this so easily and over and over again. If you're if you are a true crime aficionado, then you know what I'm talking about. You you've listened to the same podcast I do, you've seen the same documentaries I did, and you know that people like like Russell Elwood prey on the most vulnerable members of our society. And that is in part of part of that vulnerable section of society are sex workers. Which for the most part, instead of viewing sex workers as vic- as unfortunate people and victims with problems that they need help with, society marginalizes them and criminalizes them. Right. And thus provides a supply of victims for people like him, people like Gary Ridgway, Ted Bundy, you name it. You know, just about every infamous serial killer that you can name has killed at least one sex worker. Yeah, it they they see themselves as in a way they see themselves as hunters. To them, it's the same kind of hobby as deer as, hunting. As as well, there's a variety of hunting as, as deer hunting, hog hunting, pheasant hunting, turkey hunting, rabbit hunting, rabbit hunting, squirrel hunting. It's uh, duck season. It's rabbit season, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for these people, the season begins on January first and ends December thirty first. Ooh, I like that. They're, yeah, I mean, they're already. They don't believe. They don't believe that society's laws or ethics apply to them at all. They're lawless. They're completely unethical. And society needs to stop assisting them by marginalizing these kinds of people and criminal continuing to criminalize these kinds of people. I mean, quite frankly. When one of these unfortunate people who survives this type of this type of thing wants to testify, it takes incredible bravery. Yes, it is very for, for them to do brave. so. Yes, because it, in general, law enforcement really doesn't like, really looks down on these people, doesn't like these people very much, and in some cases, these people, if they want to testify. They they might have to approach the same law enforcement agency that's already put them behind bars before for petty offenses. Right. Yes. So, I mean, just imagine how much courage it, it, it takes to do that. Yes. And it's especially if you are somebody who is a single working mother. It's like if you go to jail, then what happens to your kids? If, if there's no immediate family to they, take they custody the of system. them, they go into the system, and then if they're lucky, they go to a foster home, and you might not see them again. Exactly. So, if anybody who is listening to this, if you, especially if you are law enforcement, if a sex worker comes to you and tells you something like this, for God's sakes, believe them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, especially if it's in a situation where they're not trying to get out of being arrested for something. Yes. Then it should then it should be obvious that they have a legitimate complaint. And if you are the neighbor or a friend of a sex worker, if they come to you with this information, for God's sakes, believe them. They're not making it up. Yeah, these people will need your help in that type of situation. And in helping these kinds of people in that situation, you might be bringing a capital offender, a mass murderer to justice. You very well might be, or, or even one who's just getting started. Yeah. You might save lives. That's how a lot of them get started. You know, they, not all of them stick to just killing sex workers. You know, they, Go into other places with it because the more they get away with, the worse they get. Yeah, the more they, the more they enjoy it. The more they enjoy it. That's right. So, 
that is going to wrap up our episode for the night. And of course, next week, we are going to be taking our monthly break from Murder and Mayhem to bring you Coffee Talk. And we are going to go into the history of the famous Dooling Oaks in City Park, New Orleans. <laughs> That's a fascinating <laughs> subject. Isn't it, though? Yeah. It will be. And we may touch, a, we might even touch upon uh, that alley around Jackson Square. Oh, another episode. And the French Quarter. Oh, another episode dedicated to that? Oh, there's so much little bit. It's, because it's the same topic. Well, that's so, true, but it's a different area of the city. To do wing. And we'll have to look up that that guidebook. Which guidebook? There was a guidebook that was published during the late 1800s. I believe it was published in the late 1800s. That lists the, uh, the rules for oh. duels. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. I'll it, have to go it, back and look at my notes, but it's yeah, out there. I yeah. believe you. Yeah. I believe you. There were uh, several years ago. I actually read it. You know, it doesn't take long to read it. Well, and it was intriguing. Yeah. Well, we, we will save that information for next week. And until then, dear listeners, be safe, be kind, and don't park next to vans. And if it's dark, if it's unsafe, don't don't go there in the first place, okay? Because you might get into some trouble. And if you're ever questioned by law enforcement and you are not the victim of the crime or a witness to a crime, lawyer up. <laughs>